So let's just jump right in there. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of things real quick that I, I will probably talk about throughout. Um, there's a few different methods for planting bulbs. Um, one of them is to use an auger like this right here. So uh, this would go on the end of a power drill. Um, if you have a corded drill, those are probably going to offer the most torque and the most power. Um, but you could also use a cordless drill. Some of the uh, newer cordless drills uh, have an awful lot of power behind them. And so especially since we have gotten some rain and the ground is a little bit uh, softer, these are going to work great. So this is going to auger or drill a hole about two and three quarters inches in diameter. So not quite three inches. And as you're drilling, the soil is going to crumble and it's going to pull up. So you'll have a, a nice hole with some loose soil on top of that hole that you can uh, use for, uh, for planting bulbs. So that's a, a bulb planter. Um, the other method is just going to be using a spade or trowel. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of those. This is a product called Bulb Tone. Bulb Tone is an organic fertilizer specifically designed for uh, flower bulbs, although it's useful for a lot of other things. Um, you can use it on all sorts of garden plants, etc. cetera, too. But, uh, so this is Bulb Tone. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and uh, plant skin. I've talked about this numerous times, but uh, a lot of people have issues with uh, critters, uh, specifically squirrels and uh, uh, chipmunks, things like that, digging up their bulbs. And so plant skid is an excellent, organic, safe to use uh, animal repellent that can be sprinkled directly on the bulb uh, in the ground. It can also be sprinkled on the surface uh, once you're done planting to kind of uh, sort of um, get the, the animals to go elsewhere, so it kind of deter them that way. So sprinkling it right on and around the bulb and, uh, and then right on the surface as well. So that's plant skid. This is the granular version. We also have this in a liquid version. The liquid version would not work as well for bulb planting as the granular version does. So if you're having problems with uh, critters um, digging up your bulbs or in the spring when the bulbs start to come, uh, when they start to emerge out of the ground, foliage and flower stems, you can use either the liquid or the granules to help prevent uh, things like deer and rabbits from munching on them, maybe specifically on your tulips. That's uh, unfortunately a common thing with tulips. So, um, so those are a couple of the things that I like to use there. And let's just jump in and we'll start talking about some different types of bulbs. Um, one of the other reasons that I wanted to have this talk is there are, uh, as with you know, hydrangea and coneflower and things like that. There are a ton of really cool varieties. There's some old familiar favorites, but there are some really neat introductions. So you don't just have to have a basic yellow. I mean, this, this is still a great plant. This is Dutch master daffodil. Dutch master has been around forever. It's kind of a, you know, it's just a, it's like that old sweater in your closet that you take out every, uh, every fall or winter. Um, Dutch master has been around forever. It's, tough as nails, it, it reliably comes back every year, it multiplies nicely, and it's that traditional yellow on yellow. So the throat is yellow, the flower petals are, are yellow. So that's Dutch Master, but there's also some really cool other varieties. Maybe you want something a little bit smaller, like this right here, this is called Tete-a-Tete. -tete. And Tete-a-Tete -tete is a dwarf uh, daffodil. It's only gonna get about six-ish inches tall, maybe eight. Um, so very small, but everything about it is dwarf. The flowers are only about this big, maybe uh, eh, maybe a little smaller than a silver dollar, uh, bigger than a quarter. Whereas on the Dutch Master, those flowers are uh, you know several inches across. So uh, the and the f uh, foliage, the leaves are much much shorter and thinner as well. So everything about it is dwarf. So that's kind of neat if you want a nice little border. Uh, along a sidewalk in the front edge of a bed. Uh, I have some of these down around the uh, uh, driveway near the mailbox and they've always come back very reliably. So that's kind of a nice little introduction. If you want uh, some other color mixed in, this is a white daffodil uh, called Mount Hood. It's a standard size, so it's gonna uh, compete in size with the, with the Dutch Master that I just showed you. Uh, they look great if you mix them. So daffodils can certainly be mixed. Um, you can you can put them all in uh, kind of the same area, or you can do little groupings of them. 
You will commonly hear daffodils referred to as narcissus. That's they're kind of interchangeable, narcissus and daffodil. Um, and uh, one of the things that I like to do with daffodils is rather than uh, drill a hole and place one bulb in there, oftentimes what I like to do with daffodils is dig a little bit larger hole, maybe uh, eight to ten inches across and about six to eight inches deep. Daffodils typically are going to, are going to like to be placed about six inches deep uh, with the pointy side up. Um, I didn't want to open up the bag here, but uh, all of these bulbs have a round bottom side with some kind of dried out roots on there, root hairs, and then it's got a little pointy side. The pointy side is going to go up, the rounded flat side is going to uh, go to the uh, bottom. Uh, in terms of a hole, if I dig a hole about 8 or 10 inches across, maybe even a foot across, and about 8 inches deep, and then what I like to do is take a little bit of the bulb tone, maybe a little bit of compost and soil, uh, or other organic material, put that on the bottom of the hole, and then I'm going to go ahead and place my bulbs in that hole. And normally what I do is I space them out about uh, 3 to 5 inches in that hole. So if I take a one foot diameter hole, I may put six bulbs in there. And so when that comes up in the springtime, rather than just having one little daffodil popping up with one or two flowers, I'm gonna have a really nice bunch uh, coming up. So I really like the way that looks. Another thing that you can do with that is you can layer it. Uh, if you're doing daffodils on the bottom of the hole, you can fill that hole up. Uh, so if we dug it down eight inches and then put a couple inches of uh, soil and compost down there and then our bulbs and then we filled the hole up uh, to about, you know, so it's about an inch or two from the surface, you know, then we could put something like some crocuses right on top of that. Crocuses are going to come up much earlier uh, and then they're going to be done and then the daffodils will come up after that. So they can be layered. Um, it's also something that you can do in pots. Now, I'm not um, personally a huge fan of uh, doing bulbs in pots, although it, it can look very pretty, but it's a little bit harder to do. You have to, um, you have to uh, fertilize the bulb. So these bulbs are going to need a dormant period. They're going to need a cold period. So you, can't, uh, you don't want to just keep them. Uh, you can't plant them right now in a pot. That doesn't work so well. They usually tend to rot. Uh, you can store bulbs in the refrigerator for the winter so that they have a cold period and then try to pot them up in the spring. But it's a little more difficult. Um, so I like to use already grown and potted ones in the early spring if you want to do something in your pots for some color. And I like to use these for the ground. But some people uh, find it doable and so they will store them and then pot some of those in the early springtime. Um, but the layering effect can work in a pot as well as um, in the ground so that's that's kind of a neat thing to do um, speaking of uh, these crocuses here so uh, crocus are going to be um, one of the earliest uh, plants to come up in one of the earliest bulbs to come up in the springtime and uh, these are a very very small bulb they're only going to be planted about an inch inch and a half below grade so when you when you're digging your hole this is not going to be a deep hole by any means these are going to be much shallower uh, just a just a couple inches there and this is a mixed one there. Uh, so this has uh, purples, whites, yellows, and purple and white striped crocus mixed all together. Uh, we also have some that are just one color, like just white or just purple. Uh, so there's a lot of options there. Um, most bulbs, when you look at uh, these, these labels here, they're going to say on here when they bloom. And in the case of Netherland Bulb, which is the bulb company that we've been working with for uh, more than a decade. Uh, as the name suggests, these are uh, Dutch bulbs. They come from the Netherlands. They are harvested in the uh, summertime, late summer, I guess, and then uh, shipped over here and, uh, and then sent to us. Um, but I, I really like their packaging because it's very straightforward and easy to read. They have these little icons right along the front and bottom of the uh, package. So you can see right over here, it says early spring. And if I grab um, one of these, uh, the, the Dutch Master here, this one says mid-spring. I know you can't read that because it's very small printing, um, but it's very easy to read when you're holding the package in your hand. So the crocus is labeled as early spring. And as you look across the different bulbs that we have here, 
you're going to see early spring, mid spring, late spring, and then sometimes you might even see early summer on some bulbs. So it's going to uh, give you that graphic right there. So it makes it really easy to plan out if you want to try to get some color from early April into late May when you can, uh, or mid May when you can start planting your, uh, you know, your summer annuals, your geraniums and salvia and, and petunias and things like that. Well, you can lay, you can break that down so that you've got the early, the mid, the late, you know, that type of thing. The other thing you're going to see here is another little icon saying uh, full sun to partial shade. So in the case of crocus, they can take full sun to partial shade. It shows that it's winter hardy, uh, and then it shows that the, this particular variety has a height of four to five inches. Some of these you'll also see um, another little graphic on here right in the middle. This one says deer resistant, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So if it's got some other special characteristic, it'll say that. So it makes it really easy to find uh, some information without knowing a lot about the plant. Um, so let's uh, keep moving on here. We've talked a little bit about the daffodils and the crocus, so we'll set those off to the side. So, uh, obviously most people are familiar with tulips. Um, one of the things, though, that I wanted to uh, sort of emphasize was the fact that tulips, uh, again, there are so many, many different varieties. So, it's not just the traditional red or pink tulips. So, I just brought a couple here. We have all of the standard colors, the pinks, the reds, the yellows, all that kind of stuff. But there's some really neat varieties out here. This is a variety called Carnival Del Rio. And this has this really beautiful white flower that looks like someone took a paintbrush and just kind of striped through there with kind of a deep pinkish red. Um, it's really a nice variety. This is a mid-spring bloomer. Um, very, very pretty plant. Uh, they are uh, Tulips are a good plant. For, um, for the bees early in the season. Um, so the bees will, uh, will find some pollen on these, so they like that. Um, but look at that cool coloring on there. It's so unique compared to the traditional red or pink um, tulips that you see everywhere. So here's another one. Um, this one is called Dance Line. So this almost uh, looks, it's a much, much larger, fuller tulip flower than, than the traditional shape. Uh, almost reminiscent of a small peony flower. So it's big, it's round, it's ruffled, it's not as upright as some of the uh, traditional ones. And this one also has that white with, uh, with just kind of reddish pink streaks all throughout it. The other interesting thing is on the bottom side of the tulip, you're going to have these green stripes right when the flower is opening up. So it's more of the flower bud sheath that hangs on the bottom there. And uh, so it just really gives it a unique look. Um, this is also a very fragrant variety. So if you're someone that uh, A, likes fragrance in the garden, or B, likes to cut them and bring them in the house, this is going to be a beautiful one for you because you're going to get that great color, the really interesting texture, like I said, almost peony-like, and that uh, unique fragrance out of it. So that's a really cool one. That's called Dance Line. And then I also brought this other one. Uh, this, is a, this is one of my favorites. This is called Snow Crystal. Snow Crystal has that same green striping on the bottom of what was the, like the flower sheath, but it has a very, very freely ruffled white inside. There's no other color in it. It's just white with that green on the bottom side of it. It's also got that more rounded flower similar to peonies. Um, so really cool plant. This is a late spring bloomer. Um, I, I guess all of these, uh, the two that I just showed you, Dance Line and Snow Crystal, those are late. And then the uh, Carnival del Rio, that is a uh, mid-spring. Um, tulips are always going to come up just a little bit later than some of the earlier blooming bulbs, like your, uh, like your crocus and things like that. So um, that, those are a couple of really neat varieties. Again, we have, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 or maybe 40 different colors and varieties of, uh, of tulips available. If you are looking for some very early color, uh, one of my favorites are the snowdrops. Um, I have a bunch of snowdrops at home. We also have a lot of snowdrops planted here at the garden center. So it's one thing that people see when they come in the garden center early in the spring, they see these snowdrops blooming. We have, uh, this is a, the regular snowdrop, this particular one, they, it's called a single snowdrop. 
Um, but this particular one we have planted all along the front of the building in a few different areas. This is a short one. It comes up very early in the year. It's only about six inches tall. And as the name Snowdrop suggests, it oftentimes is coming up when the snow is just melting in the springtime. So really a very, uh, very early bloom time on that one, which is kind of cool. Um, they are very, very hardy. They naturalize, so they'll kind of spread. Um, that's one thing that you'll want to look at when you're, when you're either planting your bulb uh, display or when you're picking through the different varieties. Uh, you'll see the word naturalizing um, on some of the packages. Naturalizing means that the plant is, the bulbs are going to reproduce, so they produce more bulbs, and that is going to start to grow and sort of spread. Now it's not viney, it's not going to spread and take over, also some, although some of these plants, um, like this one here, we'll talk about in a minute, the Siberian squill, um, some of those can get, uh, you know, rather, I don't know if I would say out of control, but um, they do spread uh, fairly readily. Uh, but the snowdrops naturalizes nicely. The neat thing about it, though, is where we have it planted, there's some, uh, there's some shrubs in there, there's some other perennials, but it comes up uh, in the springtime very early. It blooms, there's beautiful little white flowers everywhere, and then the other plants wake up a month later, and the snowdrops go dormant, they're gone, we forget about them, we don't do a thing to them, and they come back next year. It's one of the things that I love about uh, many of these bulbs, not all are going to be that um, that reliable in terms of coming back. Tulips are going to last a little, not last as long as some of the other varieties, but daffodils and hyacinth, uh, the snowdrops, things like that, those are going to come back very reliably year after year, and they are so easy to grow. It's one of the things that I love about them, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this, because they are so easy to grow. You put them in the ground at this time of year, you fertilize them right now with a little bit of bulb tone, fill it up uh, with soil, water it one time, like right when you plant them, water them in really good, and that's generally it. There's really very little other maintenance that has to be done to them. So um, that's a single snowdrop, and then this is a double snowdrop, so it's still a short variety, only four to six inches. Um, I don't know for sure if we're going to get them this year, but we also... Uh, have planted and sell a giant snowdrop, which is actually about 20 inches tall. So the normal ones are four to six inches tall, maybe eight, and then the giant variety is like 16 to 20, something like that. Um, but this is a cool variety. Um, this is a double one, so it's got uh, basically two different layers of the little flower petals, and it's got green and white coloring on it. So that's a really cool variety as well. Um, these are very easy to grow. I have found uh, snowdrops, I have them at home. I have found them to be um, very natural looking. They are not native here, but they do very well and they uh, don't really choke out any other species or anything like that. Um, and they are very deer and rabbit resistant. I've never had an issue with those at home. So I do have a lot of these and really like the way that those look in the garden in the springtime. Um, I mentioned the Siberian squill. So, Siberian squill, you'll also hear them just called Scylla, S-C-I-L-L-A, Scylla. Um, sometimes people just use that word, uh, or they just call them squill. Um, these are the ones, I, I usually get a few phone calls every spring where people see someone's lawn just as a blanket of purpley blue in the springtime. And people come in with pictures of it, or they just ask, they say, hey, I was driving down the street and I saw this lawn that was basically just flowering blue right now. What is that? And that's that's what this plant is right here. So I do have uh, some customers who have um, planted them in the grass and they will actually come up early in the springtime. They will bloom and then uh, they leave the the foliage of this uh, of the squirrel up for a few weeks in the springtime and then they start mowing the lawn uh, just like they normally would, and um, they just let this take over. If you are going to do that, I do recommend that you leave the uh, foliage up for four to um, preferably six weeks after, they're, uh, after they've bloomed. So it does mean that your lawn might get a little bit shaggy before you give it its first cut um, when, when it's been about six weeks post-bloom. Um, otherwise, these are really pretty in a shaded area. So these can take full sun to partial shade. Um, they grow very well underneath trees. 
Um, that's one of the other things that I like to uh, remind people about some of these, especially the earlier blooming bulbs, is uh, if you have a lot of shade trees, if you have old oak trees, or just uh, any trees in general, and it's a very shaded situation, keep in mind that early in the spring, before that tree leaves out, it's going to get actually quite a bit of sun. And so things that say partial shade on them or even full sun, oftentimes you can do those in a, in a spot in your yard that might actually be very shady at this time of year or in June, it might be very shady and the only thing that you can grow are hostas or uh, some other very shade tolerant plant like a fern. But in the springtime before that, say oak tree, which tends to leaf out very late, or sugar maples leaf out very late. I have a sweet gum tree at home. Oftentimes doesn't leaf out until the middle of May. Um, so sometimes even late May, early June. So if you have something like that, you can plant many of these varieties, even full sun varieties like tulips. You can plant those underneath there. They will have plenty of time to grow, to flower, and then even to get that uh, um, uh, energy put back into the bulb. So that's the reason why we leave uh, we leave the leaves up after they're done blooming and they are uh, inexpensive. They come in a bag with uh, with many, many little bulbs. So you can buy a bag like this with 50. You can buy a smaller bag with, I think, 10 in them. So you don't have to go crazy with it. So that's the uh, Siberian squill. Uh, if you are having issues with uh, animals eating your uh, flowers, um, I brought up two here that are really, really animal resistant plants. This one here is called Fritillaria. Um, this particular one is called Red Crown Imperial, which um, it's actually more of an orangey color than red, but they call it Red Crown Imperial. Um, but these have a fragrance to them that animals don't like. So the deer and rabbits and squirrels, things like that, A, they're not gonna dig it up. B, they tend not to munch on the plant. Um, it also tends to deter them in an area around uh, the flower bulb. So if you're having an issue with them, uh, with animals munching on or digging up or doing something to your plants, you may wanna try planting some fritillaria in the area. Um, these are fairly tall. This particular one gets about 36 uh, inches tall, so almost three feet. So it shoots up and then it has these cool flowers that kind of are almost upside down um, in nature. So really very neat. Um, so that's kind of a cool plant. And then I also brought up some allium. I always like to mention allium when I'm talking about bulbs because we sell a lot of allium in the garden center in a one gallon pot, um, you know, a pot like this size right here. And those are uh, mostly summer blooming uh, allium or summer onions. This is a spring allium. So this particular one is a giant allium called pinball wizard. Um, this is gonna be a late spring bloomer. So it's gonna come up uh, typically in mid to late May. You get this one, uh, in this particular variety, you get one bulb per package, but it will make these very large, uh, you know, six inch diameter, basically. They're saying even six to eight. So you think about that, six to eight inch diameter purple flower. So you can see they, in the photo here, they show a, a young girl next to, uh, next to the flower and it's almost as big as her head, which is really cool. We have some of these planted in the landscape here. We always have people asking about them. Um, it's another very animal resistant plant because it's a member of the onion family. It has a very strong uh, fragrance, at least the bulb does. Um, the plants really don't smell that, they don't smell bad or anything like that, but it does deter the other animals. So that's a really cool one. We have a bunch of different spring onions. Um, one of them looks almost like fireworks. It never fully forms that purple ball. And it just throws off these little uh, these little things that almost looks uh, otherworldly. Uh, very cool. So um, those are the allium. And then there's the summer allium or summer onions like summer beauty and millennium and peekaboo and uh, uh, medusa and a whole bunch of others that we sell. Those are uh, summer blooming onions. So those are planted as a one gallon uh, or a quart sized potted perennial. You can plant them any time of the year and then they will bloom in the mid summertime. So they're gonna start blooming usually uh, uh, early June-ish and then they bloom for a good portion of the summer, usually finishing their bloom in August uh, sometime. So those are the onions and they're very, very easy to grow. If you've had bad luck with bulbs before, 
you might want to try the allium because they're really easy to grow. Um, another one that's great for uh, animal resistance or deer resistance, this one they actually just call deer resistant tulips. Uh, this one is actually called lilac wonder and it doesn't look like your traditional tulip. It almost looks a little more like a crocus, but it isn't. It is a, a tulip. And uh, this one is very small, um, very, very hardy. It's a, this is an old variety, uh, been around for, uh, you know, since the mid 1800s. Um, pink with a yellow center on it, um, short to the ground, four to six inches tall, animal resistant. Uh, also has a, is great for the pollinator. So this is another one that's good for the honeybees early in the spring when maybe some of our other native plants have not yet started blooming. So that's kind of a neat one. Um, use it similar to you would uh, the, similar to the way that you would use a crocus. So uh, along the front of a bed, uh, rock garden, along the edge of a trail, uh, along the edge of a sidewalk, that type of thing. These are going to do really well and are also very easy to grow. Um, another flower bulb that uh, we sell a lot that is great for both indoor and outdoor are the hyacinths. So I brought a white one up, but we have white, pink, purple, uh, blue. Uh, so hyacinths are, are really unique plants. Um, this particular variety is going to get about 10 to 12 inches tall. Um, you're going to have a nice little green base to it. And then this uh, flower stalk is going to stick up right through the middle. And it's going to have this very full flower stem with individual flowers all around it. Um, so really a nice plant. This one and, and most of the hyacinths, for that matter, are highly fragrant. So if you're, if you're going for fragrance uh, flow, in flower bulbs, this is probably about as good as it gets. These can also be grown inside, uh, indoors. They make, um, I wish I ha actually had one to show you. I looked around, um, probably broke somewhere, but we... Um, have had a little hyacinth vase. So it's actually a vase that's designed specifically for hyacinths and they can sit right in the top of it and then it, it kind of narrows down and then it widens back out. So the bulb sits right in the top cup and then you fill the rest of it with water. The roots will form and go down into the water. The bulb will just sit right on that dry spot on the top cup and then it'll grow up and flower. So those are kind of cool. So you can look that up. I'm sure you can find them uh, locally. You can probably find them online. Um, but if you type in hyacinth vase, I'm sure you'll find them. Uh, but those are really cool. If you want to do something indoors, you can do that basically any time of the year. Um, specifically in the springtime, it works well as the days are starting to get longer. But you could do those in the middle of winter. You can do it right now, um, just about any time. And they're going to grow up and bloom and be really pretty and very, very fragrant. Um, so again, easy to grow. These are, if you plant them in the ground, they're a mid, this is a mid-spring variety, so that's going to be like late April, uh, more like early May, that type of uh, time frame for, uh, for those. Um, I wanted to also mention a couple of other plants that uh, are commonly sometimes sold as dried bulbs, um, but also grown in uh, containers. So I brought up this iris right here. This is a bearded iris. Um, this one's called, called Glowing Seraphin. Uh, it's a beautiful white variety with just a hint of yellow to it. I have a bunch of bearded irises at home that I inherited from the previous homeowner uh, that were in a very shaded location uh, when we moved in and never bloomed. And I dug them all up, um, kind of cleaned them out, and then moved them to a much more sunny location. Uh, and this year was probably the best year we've had. We've been in the house for about four years. Uh, this year was for sure the best year we've had. They were absolutely gorgeous this year yellows, whites, uh, and purples in, in our uh, bed. But irises can be planted right now um, in small pots like this. We have a bunch of these. We also sell irises in one gallon containers and then sometimes you'll find them uh, dried which is a little harder. Um, irises are not technically a bulb. They're technically considered a rhizome um, and I brought this one up to show you. So this right here, which is what some people will commonly uh, refer to as the iris bulb, this is not a bulb. This is what's called a rhizome or what is also um, would be referred to as a, as a modified stem. So it isn't really a root. It isn't really a bulb. It's a rhizome. It's a modified stem. And um, it will uh, form roots off of that and then spread. 
Uh, next week, we're actually going to talk about uh, digging up and dividing perennials, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, dividing um, irises at that time. So uh, I'm not going to go into that with much detail right now, but uh, they do need to be dug up and divided from time to time um, because they are not a, uh, like I said, not a true bulb. So um, those can be planted right now with great success. Uh, all of our perennials, uh, pretty much all of our perennials this weekend are 50% off. Um, just great weekend for that, like I mentioned before, with the, uh, with the nice warm forecast. Um, I've also brought up a plant that is commonly sold as a bulb, and it is a bulb. Um, we did not, we don't have any in loose bulb form, but we do have some nice potted ones here. This is a plant called Crocosmia. This particular one is called Lucifer, which has this really cool reddish orange um, flower in the late summertime. So it gets these very tall sword-like leaves. And then it's going to develop this big flower stem. So it's a, it's a very large bulb. It makes quite a statement, but it blooms very late. It's a summer blooming plant. Um, but that could be something that if you're looking for some really neat interest, uh, that, again, this is called Lucifer, and it's a plant called Crocosmia. So that's kind of a neat one. And shifting gears a little bit, but not really. Um, because it's a bulb, I thought I would talk about garlic. Um, this is the best time of year to plant garlic. If you've never planted garlic before, this is a great way to get a jump start on your vegetable garden for next year, and fall is the best time to plant them. Um, we sell garlic, um, you know, basically looks just like the garlic you get at the grocery store, and it is the same garlic that you get at the grocery store. Um, the difference is that this has not been pre-treated or treated at all to prevent sprouting. So the difference between seed potatoes that we sell in the store and potatoes you could buy at the grocery store or garlic that you buy at the grocery store versus what you get at a garden center is that none of this has been sprayed to prevent uh, sprouts. So that's both root sprouts as well as green uh, leafy growth. Um, and so you will have much, much lower success rates with these plants, um, if you buy, if you use the grocery store varieties and try to uh, grow them, um, but the the garlic is very easy to grow. There's basically two different varieties. There's soft neck garlic and hard neck garlic. Um, I brought them both up because people ask for both, and there's reasons why you might want to grow one or the other or both of them. So let's start with hard neck garlic. So hard neck garlic will uh, produce a scape. That's basically the stem that's going to grow up right through the center of the plant. Um, the reason that people like hardneck garlic, um, there's a couple of reasons. One, it tends to be much more winter hardy than softneck garlic, although softneck garlic will hold up just fine in northern Illinois. Um, but hardneck is more winter hardy than softneck. Um, the other thing that's awfully nice about it is that it's a lot easier to peel the cloves than softneck garlic. The downside, uh, if there is a downside to hard neck garlic, is that it does not store quite as long as soft neck garlic. So that's why some people like to grow soft neck garlic. It is a little tougher to peel. Um, Flavor is very good on both of them. Um, and then the uh, soft neck garlic is going to store a lot longer than the hard neck garlic. There's also a garlic you'll also see um, sold sometimes called elephant garlic. Elephant garlic, although it has a very garlicky flavor, is not actually a garlic. So um, it's uh, it's actually a uh, I think it's a type of scallion, if I'm not mistaken, or a leek. Um, so it's you know kind of in that same vein, if you will, uh, in the onion family, um, and it has a very garlicky flavor, but it isn't really truly a garlic. So um, you've got hard neck and soft neck garlic. Let's talk about the planting of these because it's uh, it's pretty easy. Um, basically, what you're going to want to do with the, uh, with garlic, especially if you're going to grow quite a bit of it, you're going to um, work up some garden space, clear it of weeds, um, basically make a trench um, or two trenches or, or many trenches that are about 15 inches uh, apart. So each row is going to be 15 inches apart. And then you're going to dig, uh, dig down about uh, six inches or so, um, just like I had mentioned before. Uh, garlic really likes a lot of um, organic matter in the soil. So 
Compost is the best way to get that organic matter in there. It can be homemade compost. It can be bagged compost. It can be a heavily composted leaf mulch. So if you have some really dried out, dead, decaying leaves, that would probably uh, be pretty good as well. But a lot of organic matter into the soil. Um, you can also add, um, at that point, a like a triple 10 fertilizer. Um, so in order for this garlic to grow and spread and produce big cloves, um, it's going to need some food. So uh, something like Espoma's triple 10 garden food can be sprinkled throughout the, uh, um, the bed or throughout the trench as well. Um, putting bulb tone or something like that in the bottom of the hole is going to give it nutrients right where it wants it, right down where those roots are. That's going to help those bulbs grow and form. Um, the bulb tone and uh, flower tone and things like that are 100% organic. There are no chemicals in there, so that would um, that'd be very good. So uh, you're going to break these cloves up. You're going to plant them, just like I mentioned before, pointy side up. You're going to space them about every six or eight inches. So you've got your rows are about 15 inches apart, but your individual plants are going to be spaced about six to eight inches and pointy side up and then cover it over with uh, with some loose, um, you know, loose compost and soil mixed together. And then when you're all done, it's a really good idea to put a two to four inch layer of um, either, I mean, most people like straw, straw works really well. Uh, composted leaf mulch works great. Um, that's actually my preference. So uh, composted leaf mulch placed right over the surface, two to four inches. The reason for that is twofold. One, uh, it will help keep the weeds down next year. Uh, garlic is not a very good uh, competitor, if you will. It does not compete well with weeds. So if, um, if the weeds start growing, the garlic is not going to grow very well. It's not going to get as much light. It's not going to get as much nutrient uh, and other resources from the ground. Uh, and so those bulbs are not going to form very well and the weeds are going to get everything. So that's the, one, the number one reason why we like to put that nice thick mulch layer down. The other reason we like to do it is to insulate the ground a little bit from, uh, well, I just call them temperature extremes. It's actually the reason, one of the reasons why we like to mulch all sorts of plants. In the winter time, when you have a nice warm sunny day, so uh, theoretically it's a winter day and it's uh, 35 degrees and very sunny. Well, that surface soil is going to start to warm up. You know, that, that sun feels really good, right? And it's warming up. The ground, especially if it's dark in color, is, uh, is absorbing that heat, and so it's warming up. So the surface starts to warm up, and then overnight it goes down into the teens, and so that ground freezes hard again. And so it's that, it's that, that those temperature extremes, you know, maybe if it was 35 degrees during the day, the soil temperature may have gone up to 40 degrees because the sun, uh, direct sun was on it. And then at night, it might go down, like I said, into the teens. And so um, that's going to be very hard on garlic. It's hard on a lot of plants. So that's the reason why we'd like to have the other reason why we'd like to have that nice mulch layer. Um, so that's garlic. When you plant it, water it in once and then basically let it go for the rest of the season. You will start to see, uh, especially if you plant this right now, you're going to most likely, it'll start to form some roots. And you'll probably even start to see a little bit of green top growth. Don't be alarmed. That's totally normal. It's then going to just basically stop when the ground gets a little bit cooler uh, and the weather gets cooler. It's just going to stop growing, basically go dormant for the winter. And then right in the springtime, as soon as it starts to warm up, it's going to start to resume growth. And then you can harvest this in the late summertime. Um, so that's growing garlic. That is basically true uh, for most of the bulbs here plant them right now. Um, the ideal time for planting most bulbs is six to eight weeks before the ground freezes. Um, so, you know, you, depending upon what part of the country you're in, that might be right now. That might have been a few weeks ago. That might still be three or four weeks from now. So I generally like to plan on uh, purchasing bulbs, uh, picking out my selection late in September, early in October, and then planting right about now. Uh, Mid-October is ideal. Um, our ground typically doesn't freeze until about the first week of December. Um, usually you can get away with planting even the very start of October, but this year I was recommending just a little bit later because it has been so warm. Uh, what you don't wanna do is, uh, is have a plant like a tulip or something 
uh, start growing and produce too much uh, or any really new growth this year because that's going to just get nipped off by frost and will be a waste of those nutrient resources. So the bulb, of course, is where the plant has stored all of its nutrients for spring bloom. And if it produces uh, foliage right now, it's wasted those resources and then in the springtime it may not bloom as well. So that's why I like to wait a little bit before I plant so that we're assured that we're not going to see, you know, a lot of consistent, you know, 80 and 90 degree weather where it might start growing. It's supposed to be 80 uh, today and maybe even tomorrow. So, um, but I think, the, you know, the cooler nights are going to start to come. Uh, the ground will start to cool down. So I think it's probably about time to go ahead and start planting this stuff. So, um, I know that was kind of a, a quick run through. If you ever have questions about how to plant bulbs or where to place them, you know, feel free to give us a call. Um, happy to help with that. Uh, one of the other things that I probably should mention um, in terms of bulbs in general is uh, that a, a question that I get frequently asked that I probably should have covered is when do I cut down those uh, those leaves from uh, you know if if they if a tulip or a daffodil came up in the springtime and it bloomed beautifully and then I've got all this foliage there, uh, when, how, how long should I leave that or when do I cut that back? Uh, the general rule is about six weeks after it flowers. The plant should have produced enough uh, energy reserves at that point. But uh, the easier method is just as long as the leaf is green, it's probably productive and pushing nutrients down into the bulb. If the leaves start to turn yellow or brown or you know that type of thing, kind of get mushy, then you could probably go ahead and cut that back. Uh, one thing I like to do at home is plant bulbs in areas that I know I have other plants that are going to come up around it in the later springtime or early summer. So for instance, grasses. Um, native grasses, especially some of the later to come up grasses like blue stem and switch grasses, things like that, those are great places to put bulbs because they're not going to start coming up until mid to late May. And by the time they're really tall enough to fully shade these out, it probably will be mid to late July. Um, at that point, all of these bulbs are going to be done producing energy, that type of thing. So, you know, I have a nice area in the front of the home. It's actually near where our wellhead is. And I've got grasses kind of hiding that. And we've got bulbs planted all around there. Those, the, the grasses are switch grasses. And right now they're up probably about four, four and a half feet tall. They're looking beautiful. They're green with red striping all throughout it. So they're great for late summer and fall interest, uh, but there's nothing happening in that location in March, April, May, and even into early June. So beautiful place for me to plant bulbs. They come up, they bloom, it looks great in the front of the home, and then after that, they're going to be gone for the rest of the season. So that's a really cool thing to do. I love to recommend experimenting. Uh, try mixing different varieties of bulbs so that you get different bloom times, different textures, different colors. If you're not that adventurous, there are some really cool things like this one right here. This is just a nice, easy mix of, uh, this is a tulip and muscari. Muscari is also known as a grape hyacinth. I didn't really mention those, but they're a great bulb. And this is just a nice mix. It's, it's white tulips with grape hyacinth. And so if you are, uh, if you are just a little challenged in the area of, of getting creative, that's okay. We can take that uh, out of the equation. We also have some other mixes like this where you can just buy a package. It's already pre-mixed for you. Just follow the instructions. Basically space the bulbs out so the tulips are kind of spaced out. And then the grape hyacinth come up all in between it. So really easy to grow. So in one bag, you've got your bigger bulbs. Those are your tulips. And then you've got your smaller bulbs. Those are your grape hyacinth. So really easy to grow that way. And we have some other mixes. We also have just some color mixes where it's... Uh, you know, pink, white, and red tulips or, uh, you know, things like that. So you just have a color array so you can, again, take the guesswork out of it. So they're a lot of fun. They're not very expensive. They're very easy to grow. So uh, it's really worth your uh, little bit of time and money investment at this time of year to have a big reward in the springtime. So again, thanks for watching. Really appreciate having you here with me on a Saturday morning for Coffee with Matt. Until next time, have a good day planting.